Once again, welcome and thank you for being here. Very interesting program today. Tom Leahy is our guest, and Tom is the uh, one of the, well, how should I, uh, how should I phrase it, Tom? A financial advisor to the National Indian Gaming Commission. Is that Financial close? background investigator. Background investigator. And Tom comes with a great background himself because he worked for the state of Nevada in a, a very similar kind of capacity for how many years, Tom? Uh, for nine years with the state. For nine years with the state. Then you went with the federal government. Correct. Now, yeah. Is that about the time that they, the federal government was creating something like this to investigate Indian gaming? Um, it's still considered new in its infancy, but Indian gaming actually started in 1988 with our agency. And then um, for the first few years, you know, development, um, a lot of things going on, uh, but a lot of not a staff. So um, Indian gaming really got started on the regulatory side probably about 1990s. Mm -hmm. And then I joined them actually in 2006. It ha hasn't a, haven't a lot of the states around the country that have gone into gaming, Indian or otherwise, haven't they uh, kind of taken the model of the Nevada Gaming Commission and Control Board and used that to uh, actually oh, do their rules and regulations? Yeah. Uh, most states have looked at Nevada because they were one of the first states to allow. So and you did it right. Oh, yeah, you did it right. Correct, yeah. So they barred our regulations. They copied the regulations. Um, it's even influential in Indian gaming uh, once the organization was starting because they hired a lot of former Nevada gaming agents. And so they took those processes and procedures with them. And, you know, there's actually stories in some states where you could read through their early regulations, and they would use a word search program, they'd miss Nevada, you know, like in Mississippi, mm -hmm. and you'd read Mississippi <clears throat> and still see the word Nevada inserted from time to time. So, and I can tell a lot of, like our audit programs are based upon what Nevada had developed mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were the first and the foremost. When you go back to the 1980s, who was the first Indian tribe or first person that said, hey, I think we can have gaming on, Indian reservations. Uh, What's that the, history? Uh, the first one was, you know, we go back to 79, and we go back to the Seminole tribe in Florida, okay. you know, who wanted to operate a bingo, you know, a high stakes bingo. Mm -hmm. And so there was some challenging going on, and it was on the reservation. And so there was some, uh, the, at the time, the governor, you know, Florida said, no, you can't do this. So it actually moved through the court system, you know, and took a couple of years. You know, and by, by early 80s, you know, the courts allowed the res the tribe to have gaming on the reservation. Was it pretty, was it very limited gaming in the beginning? Was it things like bingo? Yes. Yeah. No slot machines at that point, no Cor table games? Or correct, like yeah. Okay. Yeah, it started out as bingo. Bingo was, was is very big. Mm -hmm. uh, drew in the people, you know, typically not high stakes, you know, uh, very, very much smaller. Bingo is really a not a high stakes game, you know, but what they did see is they started to see people coming and, you know, depending on, you know, as we see now, where the reservation is located will depend on what kind of audience they can attract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so. so now you come into the picture and somebody and I don't know, I'm guessing, okay. Pima, Arizona, the Indian tribe down there, the Cherokees, I'm not sure there I have Cherokees. <laughs> But they say we want to have uh, regular gaming like Las Vegas has. What do you do? Well, actually, there's there's two sides. Okay, one is an Indian tribe can only have gaming that's allowed by the state. So meaning states approve it first. Yeah, well, in, in states, we, we've got two states that have zero gaming, and that would Utah. that'd be Utah and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Okay. Every other state has some form of gaming that's allowed, you know, whether it be a, a, a racetrack or a racino, poker rooms, or here in Nevada, we call this Vegas style gaming, you know, in Indian country, we call it class three gaming. That means it's a house banked game versus a player banked. Okay. You know? so, um, so what happens, a tribe would look at what they want to do, what the state allows, you know, and then what they can have. They cannot exceed what the state allows, you know, in that class of gaming. Indian gaming is classified in three classes. One is class one, which is traditional Indian games. Class two is typically is what we call bingo style games. And then class three is a house banked type game. So, 
So if there was a tribe in Arizona that wants it, you know, what they would do is they would determine what kind of gaming they're allowed under state law, okay? If they want to have class two gaming, they can open up a class two gaming facility, mm -hmm. okay? If it's a class three, then there's a little more involved, you know, and that is, uh, if it's allowed in the state, then, then they can go ahead with that. If it's not allowed in the state, then it becomes a compact issue with the state, you know. It also depends on where the gaming's going to occur, you know. Is it on the reservation? You know, where Indian gaming is supposed to be. Right. It's strictly on the reservation. But sometimes the reservation isn't in the best place for the tribe to become a gaming operation. That's why so they can go off the reservation? Well, they can, but it, it's a process. Okay. And what happens is that process is uh, typically they buy land or get land donated somewhere else. Then it has to be taken into trust for the tribe. So it becomes under the, you know, under the Bureau of Indian. And who bankrolls? I mean, this is where you get involved. Yeah. You, you yeah. see the participants. Can, can people like myself uh, help underwrite an Indian gaming casino? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It, it is an open market. The thing is, those uh, in my role is uh, we investigate anybody who's entering into a management contract with a tribe. So if you wanted a bankroll, you're going to expect something back. Right. And yeah. typically, you know, you would like to receive a percentage of the right. revenues. Mm -hmm. Okay. But so, I can't own any part of the casino. Correct. Okay. And you will never own part of it. Okay. Okay. But you be can become a manager. And as a manager, you enter in an agreement, typically five years. Uh, we do allow up to seven years on extenuating circumstances. You know, if you, you've invested you know, $200 million, and, it's, and the payback is seven years, you know, versus five years. Well, what happens is a, as a proposed manager, you've entered into this deal to build a casino for the tribe, maybe manage it also, you know, so there's two sides. There's a development and a management. Which some of our gamers right here in Reno have actually done, haven't they? Yeah, yeah actually, Nevada, not so much Reno. You know, we've got uh, within the state... You know, we have Stations Casinos mm -hmm. that is operating um, Indian casinos. There, are, uh, There's a couple others out there, uh, may not be in current operation, but may be going through some current mm -hmm. deals. Are Indian casino gaming properties successful today, Tom? Um, for the most part, yes, but they struggle, just like Nevada casinos. The economy you know, has a the, lot to the, do The with economy it. has to do, mm -hmm. location has a big, big thing to do, and competition. You know, here... When you look between Reno, we've got casinos on every city block, you know, for the next six blocks here right. downtown. You know, you go to other locations, say our next closest one is Thunder Valley, you know, in Roseville. Not much around it, so it's a draw, you know, but it's also if your luck's running bad and you decide you're done for the day, you're done for the day. You know, the next casino may be Red Hawk over in El Dorado Foothills. You know, so not as close, but we have to look at where their location is. It's different here than if you go to Oklahoma. So Nevada has that advantage. Is Nevada has that, that advantage. Yeah. Um, there's, you go to Oklahoma and you get to some of the areas, yeah, the casinos aren't 150 miles apart, but they're not right next door to each other because of the expanse of the reservation land. From what you've so. been able to observe, Tom, have, have Indian, and you know, we, we hear this, oh, we shouldn't have that casino down there near Sacramento. It's hurting, <clears throat> it's hurting Reno. H have, have Indian casino gaming operations hurt the state of Nevada? You know, it's a, it's a personal opinion, and I would say they do on the short term. Okay. You know, and I kind of go back to the availability of different properties. So we've seen that when an Indian casino opens in a new area, it's flooded. You know, there's people standing in line to play those machines. And I think one is convenience, you know. So is where that's the only property there. Mm -hmm. So once the newness wears off, yes, they have good steady customers, but studies have shown that when people first started with Indian gaming, they got flooded. But then what happens, we found that they will go there on a regular basis, but now they're starting to save their money. They like to get out of town. Mm -hmm. So maybe not coming here six or eight times a year, they come here two or three times a year. And even though an Indian casino, and I've noticed this, may, may offer you some entertainment, with somebody that was popular 10 years ago, okay? 
uh, you go to a city like Las Vegas, and you know what what Broadway show do you want to see tonight? And then who do you who yeah. do you want to see over here? The Lady Gaga here and Barbara Streisand here, those kind. And that's very tough to compete with, it, I would think. It it is, but we've got we do have some large properties in Indian gaming now that have first class, first, first run class. entertainment. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, you know, I talk you know Thunder Valley. You know, I'm using that as a comparison for local aid. You know, they have some top entertainment. You know, they don't have a big stage area, but a lot of times they will help sponsor shows and they will transport people, you know, those type of things. Is there so, any advantage uh, to any Indian tribes in the state of Nevada having gaming uh, on their reservation? Um, you know, Nevada has signed a compact with multiple tribes. You know, uh, there's a lot of competition here. You know, so for a tribe to open up a full-bledged casino here, they'd be competing you know, with what we already have, mm -hmm. Harris, El Dorado, yeah. those type of things. So we don't see as much of that. There are some plans. You know, we've actually, uh, Calavari down on Laughlin is an Indian casino. You oh, know, okay. Um, the, I believe it's the Las Vegas Paiutes. Um, have long-term plans of building a golf casino resort. Well, Tom, thank you very much for being our guest. We do appreciate it. Interesting history and a lot of interesting things going on in gaming here in the United States today. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Bob Carroll, and we'll see you next time.